I will talk about the balloon pump and I will talk later on about specifically axillary axis for balloon pump as well as for impella, axillary axis and closure. So balloon pump is a balloon catheter typically placed via ephemeral axis and positioned in the descending aorta uh, below the left subclavian and above the renal arteries. It inflates at the beginning of diastole and deflates just at the beginning of systole during the isovolumic contraction. This deflation is the most important aspect of balloon pump as it creates a vacuum that reduces the uh, pressure afterload on the left ventricle. In fact, the failing left ventricle is extremely sensitive to afterload, more so than the normal left ventricle. So that, that the decrease in pressure afterload will allow an increase in the ejection stroke volume of the left ventricle and will reduce oxygen demands. Also, uh, inflation in diastole uh, will improve coronary flow, which mostly occurs in diastole for the left heart. 85% of coronary flow to the left heart occurs in diastole. Now, inflation can be done every cardiac cycle, the so-called one-to-one, -one, as you can see in this image, one-to-one -one mode, but it can also be done every second or third cycle, the so-called one-to-two or one to three modes. The one to two and one to three modes are not very supportive and should not be used routinely. They are only valuable for weaning and for adjustment of inflation timing. So here is a summary of the physiological effects of balloon pump. So balloon pump increases cardiac output by approximately on average 20% and by up to 0.5 to 1 liter per minute. You need to know those numbers. And it reduces LVDP and wedge pressure by 20%. This is, again, related to the reduction in the pressure afterload and the facilitation of the increase in stroke volume. Now, those numbers vary according to uh, several features. For example, in severe MR, you're going to increase the cardiac output potentially more than that. Conversely, in patients with severely, very severely depressed left ventricle with left ventricle cardiac power index less than 0.33, you may not get those numbers because the LV must have some intrinsic function to be able to generate some extra stroke volume to fill the depressed volume in that vacuum in the aorta. So an extremely depressed ventricle may not be able to generate that extra cardiac output. It does not have a stroke volume reserve. Uh, number two, the reduction in afterload decreases myocardial O2 demand, which reduces myocardial ischemia. And that's a major effect by which balloon pump improves myocardial ischemia. The third effect, which can be confusing for a lot, is that balloon pump increases coronary flow, but there are caveats. Balloon pump inflation in diastole increases aortic diastolic pressure. Balloon pump also reduces LVDP. Therefore, balloon pump improves that gradient, diastolic pressure minus LVDP, which is the gradient, pressure gradient that drives coronary flow. So it improves coronary flow in shock and low flow states, but with non-obstructive coronary arteries. If you have a significant flow limiting coronary obstruction, balloon pump does not increase coronary flow across that obstruction. It has to be unobstructed or after you do PCI, this is the only time balloon pump will increase your coronary flow. Uh, and this has been shown in uh, multiple papers in the 90 by Kern using pressure wire and Doppler velocity wires. And they show that pressure past the stenosis and Doppler velocity past the stenosis is not improved by balloon pump. Also across the board, impella it generally improves coronary flow more than balloon pump in unobstructed coronary arteries. Now it is questionable whether impella improves coronary flow past the coronary stenosis, but there is one study in circulation a few years ago that suggested it may. It did increase the pressure past the coronary stenosis. 
impeller. So impeller may increase a flow past the coronary stenosis, but balloon pump does not. It still has other beneficial effects in patients with coronary stenosis, including a reduction in myocardial O2 demands. Another important idea about balloon pump is that the compensated heart failure shock, there are two types of shock, cardiogenic shock, heart failure shock and MI shock. Heart failure shock appears to derive more benefit from balloon pump than MI shock. Balloon pump dramatically improves uh, PaO2, cardiac power output, and watch pressure in decompensated heart failure shock, whereas the effect is more limited in MI shock, hence the lack of mortality benefit in balloon pump shock 2 trial, the very famous one. And there are various hypotheses for that. Uh, I've put them together here. Heart failure shock is much more after load sensitive than MI shock because in heart failure shock, chronic heart failure shock, the LV is more dilated and thus there is more wall stress and more afterload. Heart failure shock is much more severely vasoconstricted than MI shock where inappropriate vasoplegia is actually common. And the more vasoconstricted you are, the more you get augmentation with that balloon pump. That's an important idea. Also, you have more profound hemodynamic compromise in MI shock and more uh, acute mortality. And there is less tissue adaptation in acute MI shock, less ability of the tissues to extract O2 compared to chronic heart failure shock where tissues are adapted to uh, reduce O2 delivery. Therefore, you need higher output to achieve the same tissue oxygenation in MI shock. Also, more sinus tachycardia in MI shock. And as I will demonstrate, sinus tachycardia uh, definitely impedes the ability of the balloon pump to augment. And the fifth idea is functional moderate or severe MR is frequently seen in heart failure shock. And MR is very responsive to balloon pump. So those are five ideas, but just know heart failure shock is more responsive than MI shock. And actually in the European guidelines, routine balloon pump for cardiogenic shock with MI is not recommended. It's a class three. This is based on the balloon pump shock two trial. That said, I would still use, and it's generally speaking, balloon pump pump is indicated in shock refractory to medium doses of inopressor which is shock D, stage D shock or early stage D. It's not indicated in uh, uh, shock stage C that is responsive to medium dose of inopressors. But early uh, shock D is where we use balloon pump. And depending on the severity, you may need higher mechanical circulatory support. Keeping in mind again that heart failure shock is more responsive and you would more readily use balloon pump for heart failure shock than MI shock. Now, here is a question I often get asked. Let's take the case of a patient with a critical left main or three vessel CAD and ongoing ischemia, but no shock. We are referring this patient for urgent cabbage, but we are placing an urgent balloon pump while he's awaiting cabbage. So the question is, why are we putting a balloon pump if the balloon pump does not improve the flow past that critical left main or multivessel disease stenosis? So the way balloon pump works in those cases is similarly to giving the patient nitroglycerin or calcium channel blockers. It reduces myocardial O2 demand via improving afterload and indirectly preload. It's also like giving the patient beta blocker. It's making the heart function better with less oxygen. And the advantage of balloon pump in that scenario is that you're not risking dropping the pressure like with nitroglycerin or calcium channel blocker. You're actually improving the blood pressure while reducing myocardial ischemia. So that's the reason we use balloon pump in that case. This is actually how balloon pump is useful in supporting complex PCI. That's why you use balloon pump supported PCI. It helps the LV tolerate more ischemia during our balloon inflations and stent manipulation. And it allows a quick recovery of ischemia soon after you open the occlusion with your balloon. So faster recovery of ischemia, faster recovery of any potential hemodynamic compromise. So balloon pump support may be useful in complex 
PCI for those hypothetical reasons, as well as potentially this randomized trial. I will move on to describe the catheter, the balloon pump catheter. So th this is the balloon pump catheter. This is the traditional one. And you have two lumens. It's very simple, two lumens. One lumen is the helium gas lumen, which is connected to the balloon and allows balloon inflation. And the second lumen is the arterial, central arterial lumen, which connects to the tip and allows monitoring of the aortic waveform and of the proper augmentation of the arterial pressure. This uh, arterial lumen is also through which we advance the balloon pump into the aorta, and it takes 0.025 inch wire. That's an important idea. It does not take 035 inch wire, which is a traditional wire we use to advance catheter. So 025 inch, or you can use 018 inch wire. Now, this lumen is used to monitor the arterial waveform. The problem is that it's a, such a small lumen that it commonly clots, then you're not able to monitor the arterial uh, waveform. Then you end up having to replace the balloon pump or use the suboptimal radial line connected to the balloon pump console and monitor the arterial waveform. That's why modern balloon pump has actually a third lumen, which is the fiber optic line, which, which is connected to the tip as well, and which allows monitoring of the aortic waveform using fiber optic uh, platysmography technology. So you don't need to use the arterial lumen to monitor the arterial waveform. You use that fiber optic line, which is more uh, reliable and more durable. You can still use the uh, arterial lumen here to monitor the aortic waveform. So, but typically what you do, you connect the fiber optic, this line, the fiber optic line, you connect it to its port. There is another port for the arterial line. You don't have to use it. You can just connect that line after placing the balloon pump. You can just connect that lumen to a hep saline bag and you need to connect it to hepsilin. You want to try to keep that lumen open, not clotted, to prevent clot formation at the tip of the catheter. So you can ju just connect it to a transducer and to hepsilin line. You don't need to connect it to the console, although you can. You can connect it using another cable, a special cable that comes with a machine and that can be connected to that, port, to that port, but you don't have to. Even if you connect it, the balloon pump console will default to using pressure from the fiber optic. If this becomes dysfunctional, then you can connect the arterial line cable if you haven't, and you can use it to monitor the arterial waveform. Also, that cable and that port for arterial line may be used if you don't have fiber optic, you're using a balloon pump that doesn't have fiber optic. And if you're, this lumen becomes clotted, you can use that cable and that port and connect them to a radial line, a radial line that you connect to a transducer and you connect its transducer to this cable, then to that port. But that is suboptimal. And this is an illustration how you connect the, this arterial lumen to a line that connects to a transducer and that's connected to a hep saline bag that is dripped over a you know, few milliliters per hour. You don't have to connect it via this cable to the console, but you can. And even if you connect it again, if you have a fiber optic, the balloon pump console will default using the fiber optic. And you can use the same setup here with a radial line. You connect a radial line to this transducer and to a hepsilin bag, and you connect it via a cable to this back port. You need to know those for troubleshooting. Also in the console, this is the port where you connect that helium line. And on the side of the console, you can see where the helium canister is. Those are important to know in case there is troubleshooting of the balloon inflation. You always verify the connection are, are proper. You verify you have a good canister of helium. And I will explain that furthermore.
I will move on to describe the waveforms. So this is the console. This is how it displays the waveform. It will display three major waveforms, basically the EKG, which is connected to the console via this green port. So you have an EKG and the console will pick up the best EKG leads that shows you the best QRS and the best T. And then you have the arterial aortic waveform and you have the blue waveform, which is the balloon inflation gas waveform. You need to know those well so you can troubleshoot the device. So I will explain them. The aortic waveform. Imagine this is the aortic waveform before augmentation. Those are cardiac cycles before augmentation. And here we're starting augmentation. So I will explain to you what happens. The balloon pump inflates here. The balloon pump inflation occurs at the dichrotic notch, so much so that it effaces the dichrotic notch. You should not see dichrotic notch anymore. It fuses with it. So it occurs at the dichrotic notch, which corresponds to the end of T. Okay, we call it end of T inflation. It inflates throughout diastole, then just at the isovolumic contraction, which corresponds to the peak of R wave, it deflates. This is what we call the R wave autodeflation. You need to know that because the balloon pump is actually triggered by the EKG. It inflates at the end of T and it deflates at the peak of R. Okay. Then the balloon pump console, so it triggers based on the EKG, then it adjust the timings based on the morphology of that waveform. And this is what should happen. Get the augmented pressure, then the pressure that follows it, which is the assisted and diastolic pressure, should actually be lower than the diastolic pressure that precedes augmentation. Furthermore, the assisted systolic pressure should be lower than the systolic pressure that precedes augmentation. So actually balloon pump creates an augmented pressure, which is higher than the systolic pressure before uh, balloon pump inflation, but the end diastolic pressure and the systolic pressure during augmentation are actually lower than the systolic and diastolic pressure before augmentation. So you cannot go by systolic pressure anymore if you're monitoring the patient. You have to go by mean pressure, or by augmented, the dominant augmented pressure. Those are the parameters you use to titrate your pressors, not the systolic and diastolic pressure anymore. This is another illustration here of if we did not augment in this patient, this is how the pressure would look like. The diastolic pressure is actually lower after augmentation and the systolic pressure is lower after augmentation. This is because that's the purpose of the balloon pump. It creates that deflation and sucking motion that creates a vacuum and dips the diastolic pressure and the systolic pressure. This is a manifestation of that massive reduction in pressure after load. You actually seek to have diastolic pressure or augmentation lower than the diastolic pressure before and the systolic pressure lower than before. Now, how do you do that adjustment? How do you do it is lower? Once you're augmenting one to one, it's hard to tell whether you're augmenting properly, whether your diastolic pressure and systolic pressures have declined compared to before augmentation. So the way to compare that is to go under one to two mode. And the machine will make adjustments of those pressure automatically. You often don't need to do that. But it will be clever for you to verify that the augmentation is appropriate and you're having the proper waveform. And the way for you to verify that is to go under one to two or one to three mode, typically one to two mode. And you compare cycles without augmentation versus cycle with augmentation. So here you're getting a systolic pressure, you're getting augmentation, and you're getting that what we call assisted end diastolic pressure and assisted systolic pressure. Those two pressures that follow augmentation, those are what we call the assisted pressures, okay? 
Conversely, in one to two or one to three modes, the systolic pressure and diastolic pressure that precede augmentation are the unassisted ones. So you look, this unassisted systole is higher than the assisted systole. This unassisted diastole is higher than the assisted diastole. And that's what you should see. Typically, the assisted diastole should dip 10 to 15 millimeter lower than the unassisted diastole. And you should see that. Same with systole should be lower than the unassisted one. And you should not see dicrotic notch. That's what you verify in one to two mode. Another question that can actually come on board is you may get asked what is called assisted, what is called unassisted systolic and diastolic pressure in one to two mode. So when you get balloon augmentation here, inflation, keep in mind the pressure that precedes it, that systolic pressure is not assisted. People may think by reflex, oh, the balloon inflation is coming over that beat. So this should be the assisted systole. No, this is the unassisted systole. The assisted systole is the systolic pressure that will follow augmentation or the next cardiac cycle. Now, if you're on one-to-one -one mode, then of course, every systolic and diastolic pressure is assisted systolic and diastolic. But in one-to-two mode, the assisted systolic and diastolic pressures are the one that follow augmentation. The ones that precede it are unassisted. And you compare those two. This is, by the way, here another illustration of that. This is from a real life case. And again, you can get that question on board. So you get augmentation. Those are the assisted pressures. And the one that precede augmentation on your left hand side, this is unassisted and unassisted. And you can see the unassisted systole is higher than the assisted systole. The unassisted diastole is higher than the assisted diastole. You don't see a dicrotic notch during augmentation. So on the beat without augmentation, you see dicrotic notch. During augmentation, you do not see dicrotic notch. So because of that, uh, since we're creating, you know, an augmented dominant pressure and the systolic and diastolic pressure are actually lower than before augmentation, you have to use mean arterial pressure for monitoring or augmented pressure. The target is usually mean arterial pressure over 65 and augmented pressure over 90 to 100 millimeter of mercury. And try not to go by a pure arterial line mean pressure. It will not measure it accurately. And certainly don't go by a mean pressure by, by a cuff because those will just average systolic and diastolic pressure. This is how the console looks like. This is where you get a display of the aortic waveform and the helium waveform. And this is where you can do adjustments here on those buttons. So I mentioned that the balloon pump uses EKG to trigger, okay? It inflates at the end of T, remember that? And it deflates at the peak of R. Peak of R is isovolumic contraction. You need to know that, okay? However, it can use other triggers that are not advised. It can use the pressure to trigger, meaning it looks at the dicrotic notch and it inflates on top of it and it deflates just be before the arterial pressure rises. However, this should not be used. It's preferred to use EKG because uh, when you use the pressure, the inflation and deflation are timed to the length of the preceding cardiac cycle. So the response to the changes in cardiac cycle in somebody with irregular rhythm is more delayed if you use the arterial waveform and the balloon may remain inflated between cardiac cycles. So you typically should not use it. You use a pressure for timing adjustment, but and the machine does that, and you can do that, as I explained, but you don't use it to trigger. Now, pacer. Ventricular pacing spikes may be used for timing in patients who are 100% ventricular pace and who do not have good amplitude QRS. So you're not able to use the EKG properly. However, even in patients who are pace, don't think you should use pacing for trigger. You should still use the EKG. That's the preferred mode of trigger, not pacing. You only use pacer when the EKG is horrible and you cannot see QRS and T. So the balloon is not able to trigger properly from the peak of R and the end of T, okay?
And uh, this is how on that console you can uh, manipulate the frequency. You can go from one to one, to one to two, one to three. And you can adjust the timing of inflation if you don't like it. If you think the balloon is inflating too early or too late, you can make adjustment. And I will explain those a little later. But to make those adjustments, usually when you connect the balloon pump, you uh, click on start and it will be on auto mode. If you want to make adjustments, you have to click semi-auto mode and click start again. If you click semi-auto mode, the balloon pump just stop inflating. So you click semi-auto mode, you click start mode, then you go one to two, one to three, or you make adjustment to the inflation deflation timing. And this is here an illustration showing you in the same patient when he goes from a slower to a faster rhythm, how by EKG, it will adjust the timing of deflation at the peak of R in response to the change of cardiac rhythm. It automatically deflates appropriately if you become faster because it reads the EKG on a beat to beat fashion. Also notice that in tachycardia, you're still getting the same height of gas waveform. So you're still inflating the balloon appropriately to 50 milliliter typically. Most balloon pump are 50 milliliter or 40 milliliter in shorter patient, less than 5.4. So you're still inflating it to 50 milliliters, but you're not getting enough augmentation for that 50 milliliter because there is not enough diastolic time for diastolic augmentation of pressure to continue to rise. This brings that common question. If you're tachycardic over 120, should you change your inflation to one to two? So this is a patient, he's gone from a rate of 80 to 130. And you can see how his waveform, the augmentation, this is the augmentation, this is the systolic pressure, and this is the augmented pressure. You can see that the augmentation attenuates as you get tachycardic. As here, the augmentation attenuates as you get tachycardic. So a lot of people think and still think that you should do one to two to improve the augmentation. That's a wrong idea. I please want to erase that very erroneous thought. Helium gas is light and has very fast transfer and fill time. So it's not that if you're shrinking diastole, the gas will not have time to fill the balloon. No, it will have time to fill the balloon. And indeed, you can see the height of that waveform has not changed when you change the rate. So the balloon fills instantaneously. So changing to one to two is not going to improve augmentation. You will just get augmentation less often, which is worse for the patient. But tachycardia does worsen augmentation. It has nothing to do with the speed of gas filling, but it does worsen augmentation, as you can see, and it does reduce augmented pressure and mean pressure. Now, why? Here's the explanation. Tachycardia is useful up to a certain point. It increases contractility and stroke volume up to a certain point. This is what we call the Bowditch or Trappy phenomenon. That certain point is about 110 to 120 beats per minute in patients with heart failure. Beyond 110, 120 beats per minute, the tachycardia will reduce the intrinsic stroke volume, which will reduce augmentation because less volume is ejected in the aorta. Therefore, less volume can be displaced by the balloon pump during augmentation. And therefore, you get less augmentation. So a reduction in stroke volume will reduce the capacity to augment. That's actually one reason in general why the very, very depressed ventricle with very low stroke volume may not augment properly with balloon pump. Now, another idea with tachycardia is that you get less diastolic time. Therefore, you get less time for the balloon pump to displace the blood volume in diastole. And therefore, you get less diastolic augmentation. You have less time for that augmentation to rise furthermore. You get less augmentation and therefore you get less vacuum upon deflation and less reduction in afterload. Okay. So that's why you get less augmentation with tachycardia. That's why tachycardia is harmful. If you go to one to two, you'll actually compound and aggravate the problem. So definitely don't do that. Okay. 
So I'm going to give you, you know, you get called the patient is having poor diastolic augmentation. Why is that happening? They are, there are some factors related to the patient, such as tachycardia, and there are some patients related to the balloon and the catheters. And every time you see the patients having abnormal waveforms, you have to think of those two. The second one is something you can act upon, as I will explain. So I'm going to go over some troubleshooting. So these are the patient factors that explain the poor diastolic augmentation. As I explained, initial stroke volume and pump function. If you have a severely reduced stroke volume at baseline intrinsically, less volume is ejected in the aorta by the LV. Therefore, less volume can be displaced by the balloon pump to create augmentation and less augmentation. Also, when you have very low stroke volume, it's usually an indicator of very poor ventricle, which has less stroke volume reserve. Okay, remember balloon pump is somewhat of an active device. It wants the heart to actively increase stroke volume. It's not like impeller, which will carry, carry the burden of the LV work. So that's why it's terrible pump function. You may not get much increase in stroke volume. Uh, with balloon pump. Another thing is heart rate, as I explained, for two reasons, because you get a reduction in stroke volume and because it, you get a reduction in diastolic time, which reduces time allowed for balloon pump to displace blood volume and it reduces diastolic augmentation for the same volume of helium inflation, the 50 milliliters. Very low blood pressure. A very low baseline blood pressure implies an already low pressure afterload. Okay, your, your afterload, pressure afterload is already low. And or you have a very low stroke volume, hence you have inability to augment properly, especially if you have mean blood pressure less than 40. And all those ideas show you that why the sickest patient may not respond well to balloon pump, especially the sickest MI shock patient. SVR, to respond to balloon pump, the more you're vasoconstricted, the more you respond to balloon pump because the more you're vasoconstricted, the smaller your vascular arterial compartment is and the more you will get a bump in pressure upon augmentation and displacement of blood volume. So if you're severely vasodilated as in septic shock and hypotensive, there is inability to further reduce afterload. That's why, of course, balloon pump is not going to work in uh, septic shock because balloon pump cannot increase the inflation, cannot increase the pressure of a dilated circulation of a large compartment. You need that small compartment of vasoconstricted heart failure to uh, augment with balloon pump. And those are, you know, this is slide summarizes all the uh, reasons for low diastolic augmentation, but I'm going to explain them one by, by one. The catheter factors for abnormal balloon augmentation. So whenever we think catheter factors, I want to think of two big ideas. And those catheter factors cause an abnormality, not just in the aortic waveform, they will cause an abnormality in that blue waveform. Okay, you will get distortion, as I will show, in that blue helium waveform. And whenever you have distortion of both or just distortion of that helium waveform, sometimes before you get distortion of the arterial waveform, you should think of those two major catheter factors, leak and kink. A catheter leak can cause poor inflation, okay, because it's leaking, and a decline in that helium waveform. So you start seeing the inflation is less and less with every beat. Okay, and what are the causes of leak? It can be from a balloon rupture. That's the most serious one. And when you see balloon rupture, then you'll end up seeing blood in the helium gas lumen, which you should never see. Okay, that's the most serious one because if you have balloon rupture, blood will seep in, it will, the balloon will clot and it will be hard to take it out. You may end up needing surgical cut down to remove it. So that's the most serious one. You have to remove it as soon as possible, definitely within less than 30 minutes if this happens. So that's the first and most uh, scary cause of balloon leak. Second cause is, and maybe more common cause, is poor connections. So your connection of that helium to the tubing is not right or the connection of the tubing to the console 
is not right or the helium canister is empty. So you check the connection along with your nurse. So that's those are the second causes for leak, okay? The second big, big problem you see with balloon pump gas waveform is kink. And kink, depending how bad it is, if it is very severe, it will cause poor inflation progressively with cardiac cycle. If it is not too bad, it will allow inflation but the catheter will kink and collapse furthermore during the sucking of deflation. So we'll end up with a balloon that inflates, but doesn't deflate well. So we'll get distortion of that portion of the balloon pump. So it inflates, but it doesn't deflate well. And I'll show you some pictures. Okay, so it can cause either poor inflation or okay inflation, but poor deflation. So, and what are the causes of a kink? One uh, is a kink inside the body across calcified aortoiliac tortuosity, especially if the balloon migrates down to the iliac. The balloon should be in the descending aorta, but if it goes down to the iliac, you're more likely to have kink. And actually the displacement by itself will cause poor augmentation. So that's one cause of a kink that you should seek. And you can get that by uh, abdominal X-ray and chest X-ray. Or very commonly, you should look for that. Probably the most common kink I've seen is outside the body at the groin level. If you make somebody with balloon pump sit up, the balloon with kink at the groin level. That's why we should always keep a transfemoral balloon pump. We should keep the patient flat at all time. Okay. Another reason for kink is the balloon pump is still in the sheath. So it's not just in the iliac, it's even in the sheath. So it's kink because it's not able to expand in the sheath. Okay, and this is something you can tell sometimes just by looking at the balloon catheter and seeing that one of the markers is actually outside the body and by x-rays. So always think of those two, leaks and kink. Leak causes poor inflation, kink can cause poor inflation and or poor deflation. And this is an illustration here of a kink, how the waveform looks with kink. I have a better one. This is an illustration of how you see with kink. This is a kink that's causing abnormal deflation. So the deflation waveform, instead of becoming like this, sharp, two sharp dips, it becomes rounded. You eliminate some of those sharp dips. And that, along with an abnormal arterial waveform, which you don't always see, you will see it eventually, but look in this patient. He has a kink, he has abnormal gas waveform, but the aortic waveform hasn't changed yet. It will eventually, if you don't recognize this problem. So if you have that abnormal waveform, you should seek a kink. And like I explained, it could be a kink in the catheter tubing on the outside, especially at the groin level. S surveil the whole catheter and see on the outside of the body, see if it is kinked at the groin and get x-rays, see if the catheter has not moved and is kinked in the iliac or inside the sheath. It hasn't been out of the sheath. Okay. Now, this is a waveform of a poor balloon inflation, which typically you'll see that inflation get less and less with every cardiac cycle. Typically, it's due to a leak, but like I said, it can also be due to a kink. So you verify uh, all the things we talked about. You verify loose connection on the outside. You verify that there is no kink on the outside or inside the body. You get a chest X-ray, an abdominal X-ray. You verify that the catheter has exited the sheath. And this is an extreme form of rapid gas loss and poor inflation. You're getting here a flat waveform. You're progressing from something like that to a flat inflation. Absolutely no inflation and no augmentation. Okay. The most important thing is always to make sure there is no leak from balloon rupture with blood in the uh, helium gas line, because that's an emergency and you should take it out as soon as possible, as soon as you see that. And I will explain how you take it out in a little bit. Okay, so check for blood in the tubing, check for loose connections, reposition patient keeping leg straight and decrease head of bed to uh, zero to less than 30 degrees and obtain chest X-ray and abdominal X-ray. Okay. Another thing you can do in those cases, something like that, or even with poor deflation like this, 
as long as you're sure there is no uh, leak from a balloon rupture, you can do manual inflation and deflation. On occasion, those poor waveforms, those bad waveforms, whether poor inflation or deflation, could be explained by a balloon that hasn't uh, unfolded well. And so it's not able to expand because of that. And so you do a manual inflation with a 50 cc, 50 milliliter syringe and deflation and see if that can create a waveform. So the last thing to check when you have poor augmentation, so I describe most importantly the catheter issues, leak and kink. Uh, and I explain the patient factor. The third thing you check for is maybe poor timing issues, okay? Timing and poor augmentation. So there is a button here called augmentation. We always put it on maximum, you know, if the patient needs balloon pump augmentation, this should be on maximum. Why give him less? You only reduce it if you're trying to wean it, and I'll explain that. So it should be on maximum. So one simple cause for poor augmentation is for some reason somebody played with this and it's no longer the augmentation on maximum. So you verify it is on maximum. Another thing you verify is the waveform. As I explained, you assess the timing in one to two inflation under semi-auto mode and you can adjust the timing. So you see in one to two mode, is, are you having late inflation in a way that you see the diacrotic notch or are you having early deflation? So late inflation or early deflation will lead to suboptimal augmentation, suboptimal increase in coronary perfusion and suboptimal sucking effect. Even that early deflation is particularly harmful because you can create retrograde carotid flow even in diastole. So it's really harmful. So you analyze your waveform for are you having early inflation or late deflation? That's very harmful because in that case, you'll be increasing the myocardial afterload. This is, for example, inflating way earlier than the dicrotic notch that you're seeing on the one to two mode on the beat without augmentation. So you know that that's one reason why the patient is not doing well. You're increasing his afterload, okay? And here you're deflating very late. So when you deflate very late, your assisted and diastolic pressure and systolic pressure are not going to be lower than the unassisted one. So always go back to that basic concept. You should not see diacrotic notch. You should not see diacrotic notch. And your assisted systolic and diastolic should be lower than the unassisted, okay? This is an example of troubleshooting that I actually had on my interventional cardiology board. So they really want you to understand those waveforms. So this is a balloon pump waveform that is changing from one to two. And I have it in my book, figure 58. What explains the change of that waveform from one to two? Balloon kink, balloon rupture, moving from cardiogenic shock to left ventricular recovery or moving from cardiogenic shock to septic shock? Try to think about it for a little bit. Balloon kink and balloon rupture can cause poor augmentation, but they will cause a more alarming change in the helium waveform. The fact that we're not showing a helium waveform here is a hint that this may not be the problem. Another thing is a hint that this is probably not the problem here. Look at that pulse pressure between the two beats. This is the pulse pressure of a failing heart. It's a small and you're getting a big augmentation. This is a big pulse pressure. It's not a pulse pressure of a failing heart and maybe that's the problem. So here is my answer. Between one and two, the augmented pressure significantly declines. So this is the augmented pressure. It has dramatically dropped. It's actually lower than the systolic pressure. This is a patient with one-to-one -one, uh, balloon pump inflation. So it is lower than the assisted systolic pressure, which should never be the case, okay? The augmented pressure should always be your most dominant pressure, higher than the assisted systolic and diastolic pressure and higher than the unassisted systolic pressure if you're doing one to two mold. So here you're having augmented pressure significantly declines while the systolic pressure rises with a rising pulse pressure. The systolic pressure 
In this case, the assisted even systolic pressure exceeds the augmented pressure. This poor augmentation may be related to technical issues such as timing of inflation, but it is more significant than we see with subtle timing changes. And nowadays the machine does all the adjustment of timing. The machine is very smart. So you're not going to get that dramatic poor augmentation from those subtle timing changes. So the reason is in one, the LV function is poor, hence the narrow pulse pressure, and you have concomitant systemic vasoconstriction that allows the pressure to significantly overshoot during balloon inflation, which allows augmentation. In two, the LV recovers, so the systolic pressure widens and the vasoconstriction attenuates. Therefore, the balloon inflation cannot augment the pressure of the dilated circulation and large compartment as much as it can augment the pressure of the constricted circulation with a small compartment. Therefore, the augmented pressure declines while the systolic pressure rises, potentially exceeding the augmented pressure. Now that same waveform can be seen in septic shock where the pulse pressure is wide and the dilated circulation large compartment prevents an overshoot during balloon inflation, okay? So that is the answer, either C or D. But for practical purposes, in somebody with cardiogenic shock, when you see that, if you happen to see something like that or augmentation keeps shrinking and the patient is doing well despite lesser augmentation, that's an indicator that maybe his LV is recovering. That can be a good sign, actually. Good sign that maybe you should start weaning your balloon pump. There is another troubleshooting idea that I alluded to earlier. So you have a case like this one where the gas waveform is appropriate and properly timed to the EKG, but the arterial waveform is flat or distorted or totally erratic or totally absent. The issue in this case is this function of your arterial monitoring line. Would it be your fiber optic line or your arterial lumen? It's not an issue with augmentation itself or with the balloon catheter. The patient is still getting proper augmentation. You and the balloon console are just not able to monitor it. In those cases, Okay, if you have a fiber optic, maybe your fiber optic is dysfunctional. You need, to, you need to use, like I explained, your arterial lumen. Connect your arterial lumen, which is already connected to a hepsilin bag and to a transducer. Connect that transducer via a special cable to the back of the balloon pump and monitor via it. If your arterial lumen is clotted and you didn't have fiber optic, you only had the old-fashioned balloon pump with arterial lumen, and the arterial lumen is clotted. So in that case, what you can do, you can connect that cable and the transducer to a radial arterial line or a femoral arterial line, connect it to a transducer and connect it to the back of the console. That's not ideal because radial pressure is different than aortic pressure. So you're not getting real time adjustments of the uh, aortic augmentation and the assistance because the peripheral pressure, you get higher systolic pressure, systolic amplification and lower and more delayed uh, dicrotic notch and diastolic pressure. So you can use radial line, but it's the waveform will become suboptimal and the augmentation adjustment based on that waveform may become suboptimal. But that could be the only thing you can do short of replacing your whole balloon pump if your arterial lumen is clotted and you don't have fiber optic line, okay? And this is, by the way, if you have fiber optic and you want to uh, force the machine to use your arterial line, you can go to sources. The, the balloon pump defaults what we call direct, which is the fiber optic. But if you don't have fiber optic, it will default to what we call exterior, EXT which is your arterial line, or you can force it to go to exterior line. Okay. Just a brief here on uh, contraindications to balloon pump. Uh, you should know those. It's contraindicated in moderate or severe AI and in HOCOM, because especially HOCOM, of course, you don't want to reduce afterload because you will worsen cavitary obstruction. And in AI, you will worsen 
diastolic regurgitation. So it's absolutely contraindicated in that. Uh, severe PAD is a relative contraindication. Keep in mind, in PAD, you can make adjustments. So the patient, you can still put a balloon pump. In PAD, the issue is usually not the balloon pump itself. It's the sheath, that eight French sheath that you put in the femoral artery that occludes the femoral artery. So what you can do in those cases, you can insert the balloon pump catheter itself without a sheath. You can advance it over the old 25 inch wire without a sheath. Uh, so this is what you call sheathless insertion. But when you do that, there is a higher chance of catheter kink at the groin, and you should absolutely not do it in obese patient with a lot of redundant subcutaneous tissue. You will kink the catheter, but that's one way of limiting limb ischemia. Another way is if you have iliac disease, actually treat it, do iliac balloon angioplasty or even iliac stenting before balloon pump insertion. So it's a relative contraindication. There are ways of getting around it. And how do you care for the balloon pump? You should do daily chest X-ray and abdominal X-ray to check the catheter position. And if needed, you may manipulate and reposition the sheath. The patient needs to be on heparin goal 46 to 70 for two reasons. One, to prevent thrombosis over the balloon. This is less likely if you're doing inflation one to one rather than one to two or one to three. So people think if you're one to one, you don't need a heparin. That's not true. You still need heparin. It's less mandatory than if you're on one to two or one to three, but you still need heparin to reduce catheter balloon thrombosis. But even more so, regardless of your balloon augmentation mode, you still need heparin to prevent limb ischemia. One of the big hazards is limb ischemia from the big sheath in the groin that you're leaving for days. So that's why you need to give heparin to those patients. Okay, that's another reason, regardless of your inflation mode. You need to get daily CBC balloon pump, may lead to hemolytic anemia, a lot less than impella. It's usually not a major problem with balloon pump. It's actually a rarely significant problem. It can cause mild thrombocytopenia. If you have severe thromb thrombocytopenia, less than 50,000, it is not usually due to balloon pump. You should think of something else, hit or medication induced or other reasons, but it's usually not your balloon pump, okay? I want to describe technical tips of balloon pump. I saved those for the end. I wanted to explain the concepts first, but I will explain to you how to insert the balloon pump, how to position it, and how to exchange the balloon pump and how to remove it. So this is how we insert the balloon pump. Balloon pump insertion is very simple. It's really just a groin access. So it needs to be done within a few minutes. And that's why we can do it ad hoc in emergencies. The balloon pump comes with two trays. This is the first tray, which has the balloon pump catheter that I explained earlier with the three lumen, arterial lumen, helium gas lumen, and fiber optic line. And it's very easy to prep. The uh, balloon itself is covered with that blue plastic and you should leave it on until you're ready to advance the balloon pump just so that you don't unfurl uh, the balloon. So we leave it on. What we do here on this tray, you flush that arterial lumen here and you put negative suction on the helium lumen here. This gas lumen, you connect it to this valve and you put negative suction with a 30 milliliter syringe and you disconnect the syringe here while holding negative pressure. That valve will hold the negative suction on the balloon. This will allow you to advance the balloon more easily, okay? So you do that negative suction. Eventually when you're in the body, you remove that valve and you connect the tubing to the console, okay? But so you put negative suction on this and you flush the arterial lumen. That's one thing. The second thing is the second tray. The second tray has the extension tubing for the helium line, which is this, which you, you connect eventually once you're in the body, ready to augment. And you have extension tubing for the arterial line, usually 40 inch line tubing, which you flush, okay? You flush that line and you remove this from the tray and you make it ready for eventual connections. Then you have that part, which are the sheath and the wire. 
So you have the eight French sheath. And typically for patients less than five, four in height, you use a 40 millimeter balloon through a 7.5 French sheath. For over five, four in height, it's 50 milliliter balloon through an eight French sheath. So this is the sheath. You and this is the wire. Now, this wire is for advancing the balloon pump. It's that 0 to 5 inch wire. The sheath itself, you get your standard femoral access using ultrasound guidance. And uh, you can do your groin angiogram using the micropuncture sheath as well. Then I eventually put a standard 8 French sheath, then this 8 French sheath. This 8 French sheath is very flimsy and it kinks easy. So I like to advance a, a standard 8 French sheath, cordless 8 French sheath first, then I exchange it for that 8 French sheath. Okay, so you put it just this 8 French sheath in the groin using an O35 inch wire. And if needed, O35 inch stiff wire, like Amplatz wire, then Eventually, you advance your balloon pump over an 0 to 5 inch wire. Don't advance it too deep because it's not a long wire. So you advance it. Then you load the balloon pump catheter over it. And you advance over that 0 to 5 inch wire. Now, some tips here. The body of that balloon here, the body of the balloon, do not dip it in water or saline and do not wipe it. If you wipe it, you increase the chance of it unfurling and it may become hard for it to be advanced through that eight French sheath, okay? So do not dip it in water, okay? So what you do, you advance it without having been touched with fluid and with the dry hands, you advance it using one inch. You put your finger here, one inch behind and you push with one inch steps up until you get it through. If you're having a hard time advancing it, one, you can suck on the helium gas lumen again with a syringe, suck negative again. Two, you can use a stiffer wire. This wire is very flimsy, the wire that comes with that console. What, what you can use, you can use an 0.25 inch Amplatz wire, it's available, or you can use 0.18 inch V18 stiff wire. Okay. Then after you get it in, you make the connection to the extension helium tubing. This here, you connect the fiber optic and you connect the arterial line at least to a pressure bag, if not to the back of the console, as I explained previously. Now, where do you position the balloon pump? This is where you should position it. You see the carina on the X-ray and you position it under fluoro above the carina. Typically, you should position it about two centimeters above the carina, but just above the carina and below the aortic arch, definitely below the aortic arch. The aim is to end up below that left subclavian. And ideally, it has to be above the renal artery, which typically are around L2, the second lumbar. So you can tell by the ribs below the last rib, this is L1, this is L2, so we try to aim it to, to have the balloon pump above L2, but you cannot control that. It depends on the height of the patient. If the patient is around the margin of those, you know, if the patient is 5'4", 5'5", 5'6", that 50 milliliter balloon may end up below the renal arteries, and that's okay. We accept that. We definitely don't want the balloon pump to migrate in an iliac. The more it migrates distally, the less augmentation you will get, okay? This is an illustration of one. This is the balloon marker distally, and this is the proximal markers. So here, you can see here the carina. This is the trachea and the carina. This tip is actually too high. It should be, you know, a little above the carina, two centimeters, it should be here. And this is your aortic knob. It should be below it, but more so than that. This is almost at the, at the top of it. So it should be somewhere here. This balloon is a little too high. And you can look distally. Here, where the marker is, this is the rib, and this is a little too low, but again, sometimes you have to accept it. You can see here, this is L1, and this is L2, and it's a little below L2. Now, one additional note, in that tray, there is also another dilator that we use in case we decide to do sheathless insertion of the balloon pump. 
So in that case, the way what you do, you get your micropuncture access, you put your micropuncture sheath, and through the micropuncture sheath, you advance that 0 to 5 inch wire. And then over that 0 to 5 inch wire, you advance that dilator, that special taper dilator that goes over the 0 to 5 inch wire, you advance it. Then you advance the balloon pump catheter sheathlessly just over the wire. And that dilator helps you create the hole to allow you to advance the balloon pump. So how to wean and when to wean balloon pump. So keep in mind whether balloon pump and or other mechanical circular support, they have two, two big uses. They are bridges to two things, either a bridge to a more definitive therapy like PCI or cabbage or more advanced MCS, you're trying to stabilize the patient before more definitive therapy, including bridge to an implantable LVAD or to transplant, or they could be bridge to recovery after MI or complicated PCI or cabbage. So those are the semi-patient, uh, the patient is hemodynamically unstable, you did your PCI, you expect the patient to recover within the cover a couple of days, and you're putting that balloon pump to, to support him while his LV is recovering, okay? So the criteria to win and explant balloon pump are the same as the criteria to win and explant impella and any other mechanical circulatory support. I have shown that slide before with impella. So to consider weaning the balloon pump, you have to meet those four criteria. And balloon pump, you can keep it for days or weeks for as long as the patient needs it. Needs it. And in patients awaiting transplant, we have kept it for weeks. Evidently, the longer you need to keep it, the more you should think of switching to axillary balloon pump, which will be the subject of my next talk. So because a femoral balloon pump, he has to lie flat, as I explained. You, uh, you cannot sit up and kink it, right? You get kink. That's the most common cause of kink with balloon pump is sitting up. So you put an axillary balloon pump to allow the patient to sit and even ambulate. So four conditions must be met to win the balloon pump. One, the patient must be on low dose of inopressors or less. Two, oxygenation should be good, less than 40% FiO2 with P less than 10 or extubated. Now there is a debate always, should we remove balloon pump or impella before extubation or should you extubate before remo removing them? Both ways are okay. There are arguments for both. There is value in extubating the patient while balloon pump is still in because during extubation, you get significant rise in pre and after load. So it's nice to have a mechanical circulatory support to support the patient during the stress and loading increase of extubation. The counter argument is that, okay, you tolerate extubation more if you have balloon pump in place, but guess what? You tolerate weaning the balloon pump more if you're still intubated and reducing the work of breathing and providing better O2 supply. So there are arguments for both, but both ways are okay. And we can individualize. The third very important feature is that you need to have normalized tissue perfusion on the support device. Your lactate has to be less than two, your urination and your renal function have to be improving. Number four, normalized hemodynamics. So normalized tissue and organ perfusion and normalized cardiac hemodynamics, which one are simply the, your vitals hemodynamic, your systolic blood pressure is over 90 or your mean pressure is over 65 and you're starting to have aortic pulsatility over 30 millimeter of mercury, uh, including on the assisted aortic pressure, and you need to have those SWAN measures, you know, PA sat over 55%, index over 2, 2.2, cardiac power output over 0.6. And especially this, the most commonly used are those, RA and wedge pressure, only mildly abnormal. Some use echo parameters, those are not commonly used, like shrinking LV and RV size, improving LV OT VTI, which corresponds to cardiac output. You can look at those, but it's mostly the SWAN and the systemic hemodynamics. If you have all those while you're on full circulatory support, in this case with balloon pump, then you start weaning. You do one to two 
mode for two hours and one to three mode for two hours, you ensure you're still having those stable four parameter on one to three for two hours. Then once you know you're stable on one, two, three for those, then you're ready not just to win, but to explain, okay? Now you can win. There are alternative ways to win. I don't use that often, but just so you know, you can keep one to one, but win by reducing that augmentation volume, which normally you should always keep on maximum, but you can win using that. You drop it two bars, just 20% every two hours until you get less than 50%. And when you're less than 50% for two hours and your parameters are stable, then you're ready to remove. When we decided, okay, we are tolerating one to three or low augmentation or the combination. So how do we remove the balloon pump? Now, if winning successful, what you do, the patient is on heparin, remember. So we stop heparin. And while we're off heparin, we place back on one-to-one -one support to reduce the chance of balloon catheter thrombosis. You don't want to keep them on one to three while you're off heparin. So you put them on one-to-one -to, -one to reduce catheter thrombosis. And once your ACT is less than 160 or your PTT less than 45 or so, then you're ready to remove the balloon pump. And the way you remove the balloon pump, okay, you, you're on one-to-one, -to -one, your ACT is less than 160, you place the balloon pump on standby, here the yellow thing, standby, you place it on standby. When you do standby, the console will suck air. So you don't need really yourself with a syringe to suck air from the balloon. You can, but you don't need to. The console itself will automatically suck air. Those consoles are very intelligent, by the way. So they do a lot of the work. So they, it will suck air. Then you turn it off and then you're ready to take it out. Now, remember the balloon pump that has been unfolded for several days, you cannot pull it through the sheath. So what you do, you pull it up until it hits, it hits the sheath, then you pull both out. The balloon catheter and the sheath, you pull them together and you hold manual pressure, typically for at least 30 minutes, okay? Now, here I will give more advanced ideas. How about if I want to exchange the balloon pump for Impella or exchange the balloon pump for another balloon pump? I mentioned, you know, if you're keeping the balloon pump for days, maybe you're starting to get leaks. Uh, maybe there is a kink in the catheter and it's not functional. Uh, maybe there is a rupture and, you know, there is a leak and you see blood uh, in the lumen and you need to exchange it. You don't need to just remove and restick. You need to be able to exchange over that same access. And this is how we exchange balloon pump. One, you advance a stiff wire, not the, the O25 that comes with the console. You get an O25 inch a J Amplatz wire, it is available, or you can get O18 inch stiff V18 wire if you don't have that Amplatz wire. You get long one, 300 centimeter. You advance those through the arterial lumen, which is the wire lumen of the balloon pump. You advance those deep in the aorta. Now, if the balloon pump was placed recently, so you just place it this afternoon and they are calling you in the evening that there is the balloon pump is leaking or is dysfunctional or the uh, arterial lumen clotted and we want to exchange it. This used to be a common reason to exchange it before we had the fiber optic. So if the balloon pump has been placed in the last few hours, so I advance that wire through it, I place it on standby and I try to pull the balloon through the sheath. So if it hasn't been inflating for several days, the balloon pump may still have a low enough profile when deflated that you can pull it through the sheath. But don't pull too hard. Try to pull it along with the support of the wire. It comes out through the sheath. Great. It comes out. Then you can use that sheath to advance a new balloon pump or you can use that sheath to, to advance an O35 inch supportive wire, Amplatz wire, and advance over it the impella sheath than the impeller catheter. Now, if you cannot pull the balloon pump along with the, with the wire that is stiffening it through that sheath, then here's what you need to do. Then the whole balloon pump sheath is removed. So we're keeping the wire deep in the aorta. It's a long 300 centimeter O25 or O18 inch wire, keeping it deep in the aorta. Then you're taking the whole balloon pump 
catheter and sheath out while somebody, somebody is pulling out while another person is ready to hold pressure. You pull them both while the wire is still in. Then over that 0 to 5 or 0 18 inch wire, I advance a four French dilator, which will allow me to put the stiffer wire or 35 inch stiff wire. Because remember, I cannot put O35 wire through the balloon pump. I have to advance O25 inch wire, which is good, but may not be good enough for me to advance a big, a new big sheath. So I take it out. I still have an O25 or O18 inch wire. Over it, I put a four French dilator. Then through that dilator, I take the O25 inch wire out and I advance an O35 inch stiff M plus wire. Then through that, I can advance another eight French sheath if I want to put another balloon pump, or I advance the impeller sheath, impeller dilator, then sheath, if that's my goal to put impeller, okay? On occasion, if you have the 025 inch Amplatz wire, you can try to advance the larger sheath, the eight French sheath and the impeller sheath over it, but I prefer to exchange for an 035 inch wire. It may work though to advance just the balloon pump. Uh, sheath. Now, the final idea I will address is closure device. That comes up. Can we do closure device for balloon pump? Typically, the answer is we should do manual pressure for balloon pump. But you can do closure device for balloon pump, especially balloon pump that has been there for a short period. And I'm talking balloon pump, particularly balloon pump that I've used for PCI support. Okay, for complex PCI, I'm using it to support my complex PCI. So you can use closure device at the end of the case. So you don't have to wait for ACT to come down and uh, remove the catheter later on uh, in the ICU. So here is how you do it. So you place the balloon pump on standby. And since again, the balloon pump has been there for a couple of hours or an hour, you place it on standby and you try to pull the balloon through the eight French sheath with an 0 to 5 inch, typically amplatz wire inserted through it to stiffen it. If you manage to pull it through that sheath, great. Then you can use an eight French injury seal or eight French per close. Now, if you don't manage to pull it, if you're not able to pull it through that eight French sheath, the catheter has lost its profile, the balloon is two unfolded, you pull the whole system out while leaving the wire in, especially that long 0 to 5 or 18 inch stiff wire. Then over it, you advance a four French dilator, then 0 35 inch wire, then you advance a new eight French sheath. And you can advance eight French sheath over 0 to 5 inch Amplatz wire, okay? All right, so you advance a new eight French sheath and you watch. Remember, the hole you're getting, you're getting by pulling the whole system out, you're getting an arterial hole bigger than 8 French because those, the wings of the balloon are creating more injury to the arterial hole. However, when you put the 8 French sheath, you may still achieve hemostasis because the artery may constrict around the sheath. So you put that 8 French sheath and you watch and you may hold a little pressure around it and see. If you achieve hemostasis with that 8 French sheath, great. Then you can close with per close or with seal over that newly exchanged eight French sheath. It's preferred to use per close, so you have wire reaccess option. If you use seal, I would suggest placing two wires. So what you do with the eight French sheath, you put two wires and you leave one or 35 inch wire in and you deploy the seal over the other wire. This way, if the seal fails, you have another wire available for you to deploy another injo seal or just put a sheath in, a small sheath in, and take the sheath eventually out when ACT is below target.